Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. A, jo a joyful heart is good medicine. Part of my job in life is to put a smile on your face. And so there was an atheist who went to a restaurant. He came into the restaurant and the atheist sat down. He sat down to eat and he ordered a bowl of soup. The waitress went and got a bowl of soup for the atheist, brought it back and set it down before the man. And the man said, excuse me, ma'am. There is a fly in my soup. What is he doing in there? And the waitress got a good look at that fly in that soup and she said, oh, he's praying. And the atheist said, praying? I don't believe in prayers. And get this thing out of here. I'm not going to eat it anyways. And she said, well, look there. The fly's prayers were answered. <laughs> got a one-sentence sermon for you today. Thank you, Dai Lee, for helping us out on our media. Molly on the camera and Kane Baldell on our sound. And so we have a one-sentence sermon, and it's this. After all, say after all. Say it. After all. Can I ever believe in genuine peace? Is there peace out there for me? After all, after everything, after everything that I've been through, is there a legitimate, is there a divine, is there an actual, is there this sense of peace that God has for me? Furthermore, can I receive that? Furthermore, can I block out, can I blot out, can I allow the things of this world to fade away and receive Christ's peace today? I hope so and I believe so because I believe you can have peace after all, after everything that's been done to you, after everything that you've done to others. In your life right now, it may not be unfolding the way that you perceived it as a child. How many of you have, as a child literally wanted to grow up and be doing exactly what you are doing right now and suffering the way you have been suffering right now? That was your dream when you were a child. Right. But after all, after every single curveball the devil has thrown you, is it still possible? Can you still believe in receiving the peace of Jesus Christ? And I believe the answer is yes and amen. Thank you, Ms. Lee, for taking us to our scripture today. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. While they were still take, talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Here's the story. Please feel free to go back and read the entire chapter of Luke chapter 24. Super cool reading. You'll love it. Allow those words to bounce off the pages and into your heart and receive peace today. It's an extraordinary story. Beginning on Easter Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday morning. That's when this story starts. There are some women, the Bible says, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and some other women who went to Jesus' tomb. They ran there, they raced there. They took perfume to anoint his body. We have a picture of an ancient Jewish tomb. Now, this is not described as the tomb, but it's very similar. And you can see by how low it is to the ground. And you can see the stone, how it might have rolled back and forth. And in another scripture you see and you learn how Peter went down and he stooped down to go into the tomb. Now you can see how and why he may have had to stoop down and go into this tomb. Well, Mary Magdalene. And a number of other women, they went to the tomb this Sunday morning. When they got there, they rolled the stone away, they ran inside, and when they got there, they did not find Jesus' body. Now, you and I sitting here this morning, we're like singing hallelujah because we know why. But let me take you to the streets of Jerusalem three days prior and what they saw with their own eyes and felt with their own heart. They saw their master, their savior. Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw her own son drugged down the Via Della Rosa, half a mile through the streets of Jerusalem. 
out to the place of the skull. Golgotha. Calvary. Jesus had already had a crown of thorns thrust upon his head. He was already bleeding to death. He had already been flogged 39 and a half times within an inch of his life. These followers, these women have seen that. They watched Jesus as the soldiers put him on a cross, nailed him to that cross, and speared him in the side with a sword or a javelin or a spear. And they watched the blood come pouring out of his body, and they saw his head drop. This is what they're seeing with their own naked eyes. This is what they see and perceive. Not perceive, it was a fact. Jesus died. Now on this third day, they go to the tomb. Actually, I said they rolled the stone away. That, that this, at this time, the stone was already rolled away. Magdalene goes in the tomb, comes back out. She is shell-shocked. She is in awe. She turns and looks to one of the guards, and then she turns to look at what she perceives to be a gardener. Somebody to take care of the grounds. She said, sir, whatever you've done with my master's body, please just tell me where it's at. No questions asked. I'll go retrieve that and replace it back into the tomb. There's this short dialogue going on between Mary and her Savior. And she doesn't recognize that who she believes is a gardener, who she perceives as just somebody who came up on the scene. She doesn't see that it's actually the Christ, that it's actually Jesus. It's actually the one who healed her from her seven demons. She's not seeing it for some reason. Finally, when Jesus mentions her name and says, Mary. Her spiritual eyes were opened, and she recognizes him as the Savior, that mighty God, that everlasting Father, and that Prince of Peace. And her eyes are open. Her spiritual eyes are open. She's rejuvenated. You know what she and the other women do? They first bow down, and they recognize this is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he has come back to life. You know what they did? They ran to tell the disciples and the other followers of Jesus. They ran to this house. They barge in the door and they say, we've got good news. We went to the tomb this morning and Jesus' body is not there. He is risen and we saw him and actually we seen some angels too. And the disciples, of course, said, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. As a matter of fact, the Bible literally says the disciples looked at these women and said, you are full of nonsense. And I got two women sitting right in the front row. I got to be very careful. The disciples weren't buying it. Oh, they were all huddled up in this room. Do you know what they were talking about? All the bad news in the world. There was this man full of big time divine deeds and in speech. The lame walked. Deaf could hear. He, he pronounced healing and salvation. And the disciples were literally saying, where is this guy now? Where is he? Now a group of individuals come to tell the disciples. Everybody loves to pick on Thomas. Doubting Thomas. It's always offended me. It's my name. Easy on that name. The Bible says don't be offended. I, I need to get over that. The, not one disciple in that room believed either. Not one. Well, these women are just saying what they've seen. Oh, at the same time, super cool story, Luke chapter 24. Go back and read through the verses word by word really slowly. There's these two men, two of Jesus' followers. They're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Emmaus, the Bible says, is about seven miles to the west of Jerusalem. 
One of the man's names is Cleopas. We don't know the other man's name, but they were walking along. You know what they were talking about? All the bad news in the world. How this story in their life didn't unfold as though they had expected. Oh, in your life, has your life unfolded exactly like you've expected it every time? Has there been times in your life to where you're like beside yourself and you're like, this is not what I asked for. It's not what I thought would happen. When I joined that pyramid scheme, I wanted to get rich. I just knew it. My friend is a liar. In our lives sometimes, things don't just go exactly like we perceive them to go. Oh, the two walk into Emmaus. Oh, the disciples in the room, even the women who came. All the followers of Jesus. Do you know what they really wanted Jesus to do? They wanted Jesus to get on a tall horse, grab up a sword, and slew down all the Romans, and set them up and give them property and land and a real king, and destroy the Romans physically. Do you know what Jesus wanted to do when he came? He wanted to offer peace of heart and mind. No matter what the Romans are doing or what they're up to, it's not about them. It's about Jesus and his kingdom, and he knew best. That's the best preaching I got all day long. You're either shell-shocked or bored to death. I don't know which. But instead of Jesus coming and passing out lots of land or 10 acres here or an acre plot there, giving people homes or this or that or the other, and setting up leadership positions and, and ruling the world, that's not what he did physically. What he says is, I, if you allow me into your life, I will rule your heart with peace and quiet. Oh, those walking to him, those two walking to Emmaus, that's all they were talking about. Jesus comes up beside and starts walking with them. They're sharing all the bad news. They ask Jesus what he's doing. He says, oh, I'm just hanging out. What's going on? And they said to Jesus, are you brand new around here? Were you born under a rock? There's this guy named Jesus, great in word and great in deed. We thought he was the Savior, but now it's the third day. Hello, and there's no Jesus. We thought he was going to redeem Israel. We see nothing going, no action. Have you ever been a part of uh, some point or some season in your life where you saw no action from Jesus? But in fact, I submit to you today, according to Scripture, take us back to Matthew 24, 36. Please, Miss Diley, according to the Bible, Jesus walks with us and talks with us whether we recognize it or not. He is with us whether we recognize his presence or not. So today, recognize his presence. Recognize it. And believe in his peace beyond all doubt. All this world wants to do is give you bad news. It's okay not to watch the news. You're not going to miss heaven. (laughs) Right now I'm counting to ten to calm down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Because what we want in this life, what we want in this world, what we want in this nation may not necessarily be the way God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are going to carry it out. Now believe that in your heart. Believe it. And then you can have peace. Delete people on your social media that talk trash and schmack. Delete them. And call them on the phone and say, I just deleted you, you punk. And this is why. That'd be a long day for some of you, wouldn't it? (laughs) That'd be a lot of phone calls. That's what the guys walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, they weren't talking about the good things of God. They were talking about Jesus being dead. Quit talking about Jesus being dead and seeing no action and begin to believe that you can have peace in his great name. Oh, now the two from Emmaus, they're walking, they're walking, and and Jesus says, oh, I'm about to go, I'm I'm going to go on, man, I'm going to head on. And they said, oh, no, stop, stop and be with us, have supper with us. Oh, this was Jesus' thing. He went into the house, they serve him dinner, you know what he did? He took bread, and when he broke it, symbolically, when he broke it, that was the symbol 
of his body breaking on the cross, and they saw him for the King of kings and the Lord of lords that he is. Do you know what those two walking to Emmaus, do you know what those two men finally said? Jesus then disappeared. Boom, bam, he's gone. But do you know what those two men finally said? They said, wow, it was the Christ all along. And while he was talking, were our hearts not beating with out of our chest? Were we not burning? Were, did we not feel his heartbeat? Did we not feel a divine presence? Wow. And then they were saying, I knew it was Jesus the whole time. Now, to this scripture, oh, you got all these women, they came to tell to the disciples, Jesus is alive. Now you got these two from Emmaus, they show up by the time this scripture is unfolded right here in 36, they show up and they say, it's true. Oh, okay, it's true. Yeah, a couple men show up and it's true. And you know what? They still didn't believe. This was not about women or men. This was not about testimony. This was not about who is the most credible. This was about in the hearts of people needing to see for their own eyeballs. Oh, and then guess what? This is what I love about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus sent testimony, and the, and the disciples should have believed. But if all else fails, do you know what Jesus will do for you? He will show up on the scene, baby, and he will say, peace be with you. Salvation is for everyone. I am here to heal you in the flesh. Oh, this is what I love about this story. Then the disciples, then everybody in the whole house is there just jovial. They're like, wow. Jesus, they're so excited. You know, this is interesting. First, they were all sad because they didn't believe, and now they're so excited. The Bible says they're so full of joy. It's one of those excitements like, wow, I still don't believe it, but I see him. You know what Jesus said? He said, hallelujah. He said, what's to eat around here? <laughs> we'll get into that in the next week or two, what it really meant to Jesus to eat and why he left us with this last supper and this illustration of communion. And I'm excited about that. And the disciples and his followers, they ate and believed and received his peace. From the outside looking in, Brittany had a great life. She grew up watching her father in business. She wanted to be just like him and serve in business with him. She got to college, and she was trekking through college, and she needed to get a college degree, a certain degree, so that she could actually join him in business. So she began to do that. In one year, she took, th in one semester, she took 30 hours worth of college credits. That's more than twice, or it's twice as much as a typical semester of college credits. She was killing herself. During that semester of college, she had three seizures. One seizure, seizure left her paralyzed to the point she passed out and ran her car into a public library inside the walls and into the room. The pl police pulled her out of the car and said, ma'am, you just had a seizure. She had some blood work done, and while she was waiting on the results for the blood work, she went to a church. This is what she says. Brittany says, I went to a church, and I sat in the sanctuary all by myself, and I waited in peace and quiet. I wanted to hear the Lord's voice. I wanted to be healed of whatever was going on in my body, what was causing these seizures. As she sat there, she says the presence of God came to her, filled her from head to toe. And she said she's never experienced the peace of God like that ever before in her life. And she says that was the foundation for the rest of her life. Seeking his peace, his healing. In 07, she was married to Caleb Miller. He was a professional athlete, a linebacker for the Cincinnati Bengals. Early on in their marriage, he had a career-ending injury. Matter of fact, he broke his back. He quit the NFL, became severely depressed, highly suicidal, and he was unfaithful to his wife. During this time, they got pregnant three times. The first time... Brittany had a miscarriage, 
The second time, she had neural tube defect. That means the brain did not develop correctly, and she lost that baby too. Now she'd gotten pregnant two times and lost two babies. She got pregnant again, and she had an ectopic pregnancy, meaning the baby was positioned incorrectly, and so she lost that baby too. She was doing her very best in her career. She was doing her very best as a wife and even a mother. She had no babies to show for being the perfect mother. She had a train wreck of a marriage to show for trying to be the perfect wife. Her career was now on hold because she was hard for her to keep everything together. She would show up to work with this game face, but on the inside, she was dying. Her husband, Caleb, came to her and said, I, I want to check into a mental health facility. So he did. And matter of fact, he checked into a Christian mental health facility. The short story is both of them ended up in this Christian mental health facility. And now, Brittany is thinking to herself, this is not how I envisioned my life to unfold. She's the daughter of a very successful entrepreneur. She was in position to be the president and CEO. She had the degree. She had the life, the house, the car, the husband. But it was all crumbling down all around her. The counseling and the words were one thing. But at this faith-based, this Christian counseling center, they provided chapel services and they provided time. For people to be alone with God. And she again found that she could count on God's peace. Caleb and Brittany went home and they began to work on their marriage. And they allowed God to begin to work on their faith. As a matter of fact, things started to go pretty well between the two of them. And they started seeking and chasing after God and his healing and his peace and his grace and his mercy. Caleb got so involved with their church, he began to, on his own, began to go on missions trips. Brittany was pretty excited about this, so she decided to go on a missions trip with her husband, Caleb. So she did. They ended up in the Philippines, and Brittany was asked to preach to 2,000 teenagers. She doesn't have a child of her own. Think about what's going on through her, her mind. Still trying to grasp, is it possible for her to believe that there is peace for her? She's preaching to teenagers nonetheless. Other people's children. She comes down off the platform and the founder of One Way Outreach, who had invited Caleb and Brittany, the founder of One Way Outreach came up to Brittany and said, you're going to have a baby this year. Well, see, just a moment ago, just five minutes ago, Brittany, she preached this message. And the title of the message was, God's possibilities are greater than man's percentages. Oh, she preached that for 30 or 40 minutes. God's possibilities are greater than man's percentages. She's flying high as a kite. She stepped down off the platform. Somebody tells her she's going to have a baby. And she said, I can't have a baby. I've, I've tried three times and it was unsuccessful every time. And if I try again, the doctors say for me to have a healthy baby, the chances are slim to none. She said that right after it gotten done preaching about God's possibilities are greater than man's percentages. The founder of One Way Outreach said, Miss Brittany, you just got done preaching this excellent ministry or message. How about let's watch God? The next day, Brittany took a pregnancy test. Was, she was pregnant. And on December the 16th, 2010, she had a healthy baby girl named Grace Ruby Miller. You see, when God gives you peace, it's not just this ushy-gushy feeling. He follows it up with divine providence. With action. Oh, since then they've had two other children. Said they have three babies now. Three kids. Oh, she is the president and CEO now of Jeff Ruby Luxury Steakhouse Entertainment. She oversees seven restaurants. Oh, they've entertained presidents and dignitaries from all over the world.
The Food Network says that this operation is among the 50 best restaurants in America. USA Today says that Jeff Ruby Luxury Steakhouses are in the top 10 steakhouses in America. And Brittany is the president and CEO. But do you know, it's not because of her earthly success that she's got peace inside of her. It's because she knew to go find quiet places when the heat was on. And to get alone with God and allow this world to stuff and stuff and trash and schmack and fall down by the ankle sides and walk away from it and allow it to be God's and not hers. That's why Caleb and Brittany and their children have peace in their home. So after all, can we see that one sentence sermon, Miss Diley? After all, after all, can I ever believe in genuine peace? After all, this is not the life I expected, it's not the life I wanted. But after all, can I ever believe in genuine peace? Yes, you can, because Jesus Christ himself comes through every wall that we put up, just like he came through that wall. And stepped inside to be with those disciples. He comes through every wall that you build up and he wants to stand right beside you, put his arms around you and hold you close and give you peace. Would you please stand with me today? Would our prayer partners please come? Our prayer, our prayer team please come. Today, if you'd like to be, if you'd like Jesus to save your soul, if you'd like a deeper relationship with Jesus, if you'd like salvation, Repeat this prayer after me. Also, if you would like to be healed, if you'd like healing in your body, in the name of Jesus, in the not my name. Look, it's two. It's, it's twelve oh six or something on in the middle of a February, getting close to March in two thousand and twenty three. There's nothing really special about this day other than the fact that Jesus will and can and has stepped through these walls, and He's standing right beside you, and He's holding on to you, saying, "I can offer you." peace of mind. Allow him to do that today. Allow him to do that today. Repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I love you. Forgive me of my sin. Heal my body. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Touch my broken bones right now. My broken muscles. My broken organs. Heal me from suffering of anxiety and depression. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Today I invite you to get some peace and quiet here for a moment before we depart in the name of Jesus if you need healing or you need a prayer of blessing or even a prayer of salvation I know we just prayed for all those things if, if you want more prayer for any of those things or other items in your life please come and we'll pray for you we'll be glad to but whatever you do don't leave here without allowing the peace of God to be offered to your heart and your mind. Allow Jesus to take you by the hand, touch your heart, and touch your mind. In Jesus' name. River Life Church, it's good to see you this morning. Allow me to read to you a tithe and offering scripture today. And out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, let me start with verse 9. As it's written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks 
to God. Verse 13, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. And so the Apostle Paul is teaching here about generosity. Here's the bottom line. I want to say thank you and God bless you for your giving. Your giving goes through our church into the community, worldwide missions, through the food ministry, youth ministry, children's ministry, all kinds of avenues to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so let me say thank you and God bless you for your generous giving. There are multiple ways to give. You can give online today. You can text to give. You can uh, uh, go to the QR code that's on the back of the chair right in front of you, which is a text to give. You can mail a check in. You can put your offering in the boxes on the way out of the sanctuary and the foyer. I love you very much. Have a fabulous Sunday morning.